The stories you're about to hear are completely fictional and meant for entertainment only. They aren't based on real people or events, and any similarities are purely coincidental. These tales are crafted to be spooky and suspenseful, so just sit back, relax, and enjoy the imaginative ride. And remember, subscribe, or I might just turn these stories into reality. I was a subject in a CIA sleep experiment gone wrong, and now I can't wake up. Hey everyone, I'm writing this because I need to get it off my chest. If I don't, I feel like I'm going to go insane. This all started a few months ago when I found myself in a dark corner of the internet. The kind of place where you don't stumble upon by accident. I was on the dark web, browsing through forums and marketplaces out of sheer boredom and curiosity. That's when I saw it. A post titled, Earn $5,000 for Participating in a Sleep Experiment. $5,000 just for sleeping? It sounded too good to be true, but I was desperate for cash. College debt was piling up, and I was getting desperate. I clicked on the link, and it took me to a page with very minimal information. It had a sign-up form, and some vague details about a sleep study being conducted by a private research group. There were no contact details, no names, just an anonymous email to reach out to if interested. I sent an email expressing my interest, and within a few hours I got a response. They wanted to schedule a video interview. I thought it was strange to be contacted so quickly, but again, the money was too tempting. We set up a call for the next day. During the video call, I couldn't see their faces, only hear their voices. They asked me some routine questions about my sleep habits and overall health. They were extremely interested in whether I had any history of sleep disorders or mental illness. I passed the criteria and they said I'd be perfect for the study. They sent over a contract for me to sign. The contract was long, full of legal jargon that I barely understood, but the gist of it was simple. I'd be participating in a sleep study for two weeks, during which time I'd be under constant surveillance. They would cover all my expenses and pay me $5,000 at the end. There was a clause about confidentiality and agreeing to not hold them liable for any unintended side effects. I signed it without giving it much thought. They sent me a package a few days later. Inside were some pills, a few syringes, and a laptop. The instructions were simple. I was to start the experiment the following Monday. I needed to inject myself with the provided syringe every night before bed and take one of the pills. The laptop was to be kept on at all times during the study, as it was how they'd be monitoring me. They assured me that all the data would be collected remotely and that I'd never have to leave my apartment. The first few days were uneventful. I'd inject myself, take the pill and fall asleep within minutes. My dreams were vivid, but nothing too out of the ordinary. However, on the fifth night, things took a turn. I woke up in the middle of the night, unable to move. Sleep paralysis, I thought. It wasn't the first time it had happened to me, but this felt different. My eyes darted around the room, and that's when I saw it. A figure standing in the corner of my room, shrouded in darkness. I couldn't make out any details but I could feel its eyes on me, staring. My heart was racing, and I tried to scream, but no sound came out. The figure slowly moved closer, and as it did, I could see its face. It was distorted, like a glitching video game character, with parts of its face shifting and changing. It leaned in close to my ear and whispered something I couldn't understand. The voice was garbled, like it was underwater. 
Then just as quickly as it appeared, it was gone. I jolted awake, drenched in sweat. I grabbed the laptop and sent a frantic message to the researchers, describing what had happened. Their response was immediate and unsettlingly calm. Continue with the experiment. Such experiences are to be expected. I felt a pit in my stomach, but I convinced myself that it was just a bad dream. I carried on with the experiment. Over the next few days, the nightmares grew worse. The figure would visit me every night, each time getting closer and more real. It wasn't just sleep paralysis anymore. It felt like something was actually there with me. I started seeing it during the day too, out of the corner of my eye. At first, I thought I was just tired, but it became more persistent. I'd see it in reflections, standing behind me, always just out of reach. I stopped leaving my apartment. I was too afraid of what might happen if I did. My friends and family tried to reach out, but I ignored their calls and messages. I felt like I was losing my mind. The researchers' responses were always the same. Continue with the experiment. By the end of the second week, I was a wreck. I hadn't slept properly in days, and the figure was now a constant presence. I could feel its breath on my neck, hear its whispers in my ear. I tried to quit the experiment, but the researchers wouldn't let me. They reminded me of the contract I signed, the one that said I couldn't back out until the experiment was over. I was trapped. On the final night, I was barely holding on. I injected myself, took the pill, and lay down, dreading what was to come. I tried to stay awake, but the drugs pulled me under. This time, the figure didn't wait. It was there as soon as I closed my eyes, standing over me. Its face was clearer now, and I could see that it wasn't just one face, but many, all shifting and changing, screaming silently. It reached out and touched my forehead, and suddenly, I was somewhere else. I was in a dark, endless void, floating. The figure was there too, but now it was joined by others, all staring at me with those same shifting faces. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. I felt a hand wrap around my throat, squeezing. I couldn't breathe. I was dying. Then I woke up, but I wasn't in my bed. I was still in the void, still surrounded by those figures. I tried to move, but I couldn't. I was paralyzed again. I realized, with growing horror, that I wasn't waking up. I was trapped in the nightmare forever. The laptop was still on, and I could see the researchers' messages flashing on the screen. Continue with the experiment. It's been weeks now, maybe even months. I can't tell anymore. I'm still here, in this dark, endless void, with the figures. They whisper to me, telling me things I don't want to hear, showing me things I don't want to see. I don't know if I'll ever wake up. If you're reading this, please, don't make the same mistake I did. Don't trust those people. Don't let curiosity get the better of you, because once you're in, there's no way out. I don't know how long I've been here. Time doesn't exist in this place, this void. Every second stretches into eternity, and the lines between dreams and reality have long since blurred. The figures are relentless, their whispers growing louder, more insistent. They tell me things about myself, about the world, about the people I thought I knew, things I never wanted to know. It started to affect my mind in ways I can't fully explain. My memories began to warp, blending with the horrors I was shown. I'd see my family, my friends, twisted and deformed, their faces merging with those of the figures. I couldn't tell what was real anymore, if anything was. Every familiar face became a nightmare version, whispering 
those same garbled underwater words. I remember one day, if you can call it that, I saw my mother. She was sitting in my living room, just like she used to when I was a kid, but her eyes were wrong. They were black, hollow voids, and when she opened her mouth to speak, the same distorted whispers spilled out. Her skin began to peel away, revealing the shifting faces beneath, all screaming silently. I tried to reach out to her, but my hand passed through like she was made of smoke. The figures laughed, a sound that was more of a vibration in the air than an actual noise. They were enjoying this, feeding off my fear and confusion. The worst part was the pain. It wasn't just mental anymore, it was physical. I could feel them touching me, clawing at my skin. I'd look down and see my flesh being torn away, layer by layer, revealing raw bloody muscle beneath. I felt every agonizing moment, but I couldn't move, couldn't scream. I was their plaything, and there was nothing I could do about it. The researchers' messages continued to flash on the laptop, but now they were different. They weren't just instructions anymore, they were threats. You signed the contract, they'd remind me. You belong to us now. It dawned on me that this was never about sleep or science. It was something much darker, much more sinister. I tried to fight back, to break free from their control, but it was no use. The more I struggled, the tighter their grip became. They started to show me things, visions of other people who had been trapped here before me. I saw their faces, their desperate eyes pleading for help. Some of them had been here for years, maybe even decades. They'd lost all sense of self, becoming part of the void, part of the figures that tormented me. One night, or whatever it was, something different happened. One of the figures came closer than usual. It reached out and touched my forehead again, but this time, instead of pulling me deeper into the void, it showed me something. It was like a window opening in my mind, a glimpse of the real world. I saw my apartment, but it was dark, empty. The laptop was still on, the screen casting an eerie glow in the room. I saw myself lying in bed, motionless. I looked pale, almost lifeless. My body was wasting away, and it was clear that I hadn't eaten or drunk anything in a long time. The sight of my own frail, deteriorating body filled me with a new kind of horror. I was dying. I tried to scream, to reach out, but I was pulled back into the void before I could do anything. The figures were angry, their whispers turning into shouts. They didn't want me to see the outside world, to remember that I was once human. They needed me to stay here, trapped and tormented, feeding off my fear and despair. The pain became unbearable. It wasn't just my skin anymore. It felt like they were tearing me apart from the inside out. I could feel my organs being pulled and twisted, my bones snapping. The agony was beyond anything I could have imagined, and I begged for it to stop, for them to just end it. But they wouldn't. They wanted me to suffer. In a rare moment of clarity, I thought about the contract I signed, that stupid, hastily read piece of paper that had sealed my fate. I wondered how many others had been tricked the same way, lured by the promise of easy money. I felt a surge of anger, but it was quickly drowned by the overwhelming sense of helplessness. I started to lose pieces of myself. My memories, my personality, they were being stripped away, leaving nothing but a hollow shell. The figures took everything, leaving me with nothing but the pain and the endless void. I couldn't remember my own name, my past, or why I was even fighting anymore. I was becoming one of them. Every now and then, I'd catch glimpses of the outside world, 
brief flashes that only made my suffering worse. I saw my friends moving on with their lives, oblivious to my fate. I saw my parents mourning, thinking I had disappeared without a trace. I wanted to reach out to them, to tell them I was still here, but it was impossible. The void was my prison, and there was no escape. As my mind continued to unravel, I realized that this was exactly what the researchers wanted. They weren't studying sleep. They were studying suffering, torment, the limits of the human mind. And I was their perfect subject, trapped in a nightmare with no end. I don't know how long I've been trapped here. Days, weeks, months. Time has lost all meaning. The figure's whispers are a constant, a background noise that I can never escape. They've taken everything from me, my identity, my memories, my sanity. I'm nothing more than a vessel for their torment, a plaything in their endless game. One day, or night, it's impossible to tell. Something changed. The figures grew agitated, their whispers becoming frantic. They were afraid, which was new. I hadn't seen them show any emotion other than sadistic pleasure. I didn't understand what was happening until I felt it, a pull, like someone was dragging me out of the void. For a brief, shining moment, I was back in my apartment. I could feel my body, weak and frail, lying on the bed. My muscles ached from disuse. My throat was parched, and I could barely move. But I was back. The laptop was still on, the screen flashing with unread messages. The most recent one caught my eye. We're losing him. Increase the dosage. Before I could process what that meant, I was yanked back into the void. The figures were furious, their whispers now a deafening roar. They clawed at me, their touch like ice on my skin, but I fought back. I didn't know how, but I could feel the connection to the real world. It was weak, but it was there. I clung to it, using it as a lifeline. The more I fought, the more I could feel the pull. I started to remember things. My name, my past, the contract I signed. It all came flooding back, and with it, a surge of anger and determination. They had taken so much from me, but I wasn't going to let them win. I had to find a way out. I focused on the laptop, on the messages from the researchers. If they could increase the dosage, maybe they could bring me back. I just had to get their attention. I screamed, the sound echoing in the void, and for the first time, I felt like they heard me. The figures recoiled, their whispers turning into shrieks of rage. They were losing control and they knew it. I was pulled back again, this time for longer. I could hear voices, real voices, not the garbled whispers of the figures. They were discussing me, my condition, the experiment. I heard one of them say my name, and it was like a jolt of electricity through my body. I tried to move, to speak, but I was too weak. All I could do was lie there, listening. Subject 17 is showing signs of resistance, one voice said. We need to sedate him further. No, another voice argued. If we push him too far, we'll lose him. We need to bring him out slowly. There was a tense silence, and then the first voice spoke again. Fine, reduce the dosage, but keep monitoring him. If he shows any signs of waking up, increase it immediately. I felt a needle prick my arm, and then everything went dark again. When I woke up, I was back in the void, but something was different. The figures were still there, but they seemed weaker, less substantial. I could feel the connection to the real world growing stronger. I focused on it, using every ounce of my strength to fight back. The figures screamed, their forms flickering like static on a broken TV. I saw flashes of my apartment, 
of the researchers monitoring me. They were arguing, their faces tense. I tried to reach out to them to make them see that I was still here, still fighting. I felt my fingers twitch, a small movement, but it was enough. One of the researchers noticed, his eyes widening in shock. He's moving, he said. He's coming back. The figures howled, their voices blending into a cacophony of noise. They clawed at me, their touch burning my skin. But I didn't stop. I pushed harder, forcing my way back to the surface. The connection grew stronger, and I could feel my body again. It was weak, but it was there. With one final push, I broke free. The void shattered, and I was back in my apartment. The laptop was still on, the screen flashing with messages. I could hear the researchers' voices, their excitement palpable. He's back, one of them said. We did it. I tried to speak, but my throat was too dry. I managed a weak croak, and one of the researchers leaned closer, his face filled with concern. Can you hear me? He asked. I nodded, my movement slow and sluggish. He handed me a glass of water, and I drank greedily, the cool liquid soothing my parched throat. You're safe now, he said. We've got you. But I knew it wasn't over. The figures were still there, lurking in the corners of my mind, waiting for their chance to drag me back. I could feel their presence, a constant reminder of the nightmare I'd endured. The researchers continued to monitor me, their expressions a mix of relief and curiosity. They asked me questions, trying to understand what had happened, but I couldn't find the words to explain. How do you describe a void filled with shifting faces and whispers that tear at your sanity? All I knew was that I wasn't out of the woods yet. The figures were still there, and I had a feeling they wouldn't let me go so easily. I was back in the real world, but the nightmare was far from over. I thought escaping the void would be the end of it, but I couldn't have been more wrong. The real nightmare began once I was back in my apartment. The figures might have lost their grip on my body, but they had left a mark on my mind that wouldn't fade. The researchers kept me under observation, asking endless questions about my experience. They were fascinated, treating me like some rare specimen. They didn't understand the horror of it constant dread I lived with. They saw it as a successful experiment, something to be proud of. I tried to resume my life, but everything felt wrong. I couldn't sleep, not without seeing their faces, hearing their whispers. Every time I closed my eyes, I was back in the void, the figures reaching out to me, their cold fingers wrapping around my throat. I started to fear sleep staying awake for days at a time, but it didn't help. The exhaustion only made the vision stronger. The researchers prescribed medication to help with the nightmares, but it only made things worse. The pills dulled my senses, blurring the lines between reality and the void. I started seeing the figures during the day, lurking in the shadows, watching me. Their whispers followed me everywhere, a constant reminder that I wasn't free. My friends and family tried to reach out, but I couldn't face them. How could I explain what I was going through? They wouldn't believe me, and even if they did, what could they do? I was alone, trapped in a waking nightmare with no escape. One night, the void came for me again. I was lying in bed trying to keep my eyes open when I felt a familiar chill. The room grew colder, the shadows lengthening and twisting. I knew what was coming, but I was too tired to fight it. The figures emerged from the darkness, their faces shifting and contorting. They surrounded me, their whispers filling my ears. 
You can't escape us, they said. You belong to us. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. They reached out, their fingers like ice on my skin. I felt myself being pulled back into the void, the room fading away. I fought with everything I had, but it was no use. They were too strong. I woke up in the void, the figures standing over me, their faces twisted in cruel smiles. They didn't speak, but I could hear their thoughts, feel their hatred. They showed me images, visions of the other subjects they had tormented. I saw their suffering, their despair. It was endless, a cycle of pain and fear. I saw one subject, a man who had been trapped for years. His mind had shattered, leaving him a hollow shell. He wandered the void, a ghost of his former self, his eyes empty and lifeless. I knew that would be my fate if I didn't find a way out. But how? How do you fight something that isn't real, that exists only in your mind? I felt hopeless, the despair threatening to consume me. The figures sensed it, their whispers growing louder, more insistent. Give in, they said. Let go. It's the only way. I was tempted, so tempted to just give up, to let them take me. The pain, the fear, it was all too much. But something inside me refused to surrender. I couldn't let them win. I had to find a way to fight back, to reclaim my mind. I started to focus on the real world, on the things that anchored me. My apartment, my friends, my family. I forced myself to remember their faces, their voices. I clung to those memories, using them as a lifeline. The figures tried to pull me away, but I held on, refusing to let go. The more I focused on the real world, the weaker the figures became. Their whispers grew fainter, their forms less solid. I felt their grip loosening, and I pushed harder, fighting my way back to the surface. It was a battle, every step a struggle, but I wouldn't give up. I woke up drenched in sweat, my heart racing. The room was dark, the shadows deep, but the figures were gone. I was back in my apartment, the familiar surroundings a comfort. I felt a surge of hope, a belief that maybe, just maybe, I could beat this. I reached for the laptop the screen still flashing with messages. The researchers were worried, their words frantic. They didn't understand what I was going through, but they were trying to help. I typed a message, my fingers trembling. I'm still here, I wrote. I'm fighting. Their response was immediate. Stay strong. We're doing everything we can. It wasn't much, but it was something. I wasn't alone. I had people who cared, who were trying to help. It gave me strength, a determination to keep fighting. The road to recovery was long and difficult. The figures didn't give up easily, their whispers haunting me day and night. But I refused to let them win. I clung to the real world, to the things that mattered, using them as my anchor. It was a constant battle but one I was determined to win. As the days turned into weeks, I started to feel stronger. The figures hold on me weakened, their whispers fading. I could sleep again, the nightmares less frequent. It wasn't perfect, but it was progress. I knew I'd never be completely free, that the void would always be a part of me. But I also knew that I could fight it, that I could reclaim my mind, it would be a long journey, but one I was ready to take. And so I continue to fight, every day a struggle, but one I won't give up on. I won't let the void take me. I won't let the figures win. I will reclaim my life, my sanity, my freedom, one step at a time. Months have passed since I escaped the void, but the scars remain. I still struggle with sleep and the fear of being pulled back into that nightmare never leaves me. The figures are weaker now, their whispers faint, 
but they're still there, lurking in the corners of my mind. Every night I brace myself for their return, and every night I fight to stay in the real world. The researchers haven't stopped monitoring me. They call it follow-up care, but I know they're still studying me, still fascinated by what happened. They're more careful now, more attentive to my needs, but I can see the curiosity in their eyes. They want to understand, to replicate the experiment, to learn from my suffering. It's a chilling thought, knowing that they see me as a data point, not a person. I try to focus on rebuilding my life, but it's hard. My friends and family are supportive, but they don't understand. How could they? I can't even explain it to myself. The void, the figures, the constant dread, it's beyond words. I've started seeing a therapist, but it's a slow process. Talking about it helps, but it also brings back the memories, the fear. Some days, it feels like I'm making progress. Other days, it feels like I'm back at square one. One night, as I lay in bed, struggling to sleep, I decided to confront my fears head on. I turned on the laptop, the same one they gave me for the experiment. I hadn't touched it since afraid of what I might find, but something in me needed answers, closure. I needed to understand what had happened, to make sense of the nightmare. I opened the files they had left on the laptop, sifting through endless daughter logs, notes and recordings. It was overwhelming, but I kept going, driven by a desperate need for answers. What I found was worse than I could have imagined. The experiment wasn't just a sleep study. It was part of a larger project, one that involved manipulating the human mind, exploring the boundaries of consciousness. They had been experimenting on people for years, using the dark web to recruit unsuspecting volunteers. I wasn't the first, and I wouldn't be the last. I found files on other subjects, their experiences hauntingly similar to mine. They had all been promised money, lured by the same vague contract. They had all been trapped in the void, tormented by the figures. And like me, they had all been left to suffer, their minds shattered, their lives destroyed. The researchers knew what they were doing. They knew the risks, the potential for harm, but they didn't care. They were driven by a twisted sense of curiosity, a desire to push the limits of human endurance. They saw us as expendable, mere tools in their pursuit of knowledge. I felt a surge of rage, a burning need for justice. These people had ruined my life, and they needed to be stopped. I copied the files, every incriminating detail, and started reaching out to others. I found forums, support groups, places where people shared their stories of dark web horrors. I shared my story, the files, the evidence. I wanted to expose the truth, to bring down those responsible. The response was overwhelming. People reached out, sharing their own experiences, their own nightmares. Together, we started to build a case, to gather evidence to find others who had been victimized. It was slow, painstaking work, but it gave me purpose, a reason to keep fighting. One night, as I was working late, I got an email from an anonymous source. They claimed to have information, something that could help us. They wanted to meet in person, a risky proposition, but I was desperate. I agreed, setting up a meeting in a public place a cafe downtown. The man who met me was nervous, glancing around like he expected to be followed. He handed me a flash drive, his hands shaking. This has everything, he said. Names, dates, locations. It's all there. I thanked him, but he just shook his head. Be careful, he said. They're watching. 
They won't let this go easily. I went home and plugged in the flash drive, my heart pounding. The files were detailed, incriminating. They named the researchers, the institutions funding them, the locations of their labs. It was a gold mine of information, enough to bring them down. But the man was right. They were watching. The next day, my apartment was broken into. They didn't steal anything, but they left a message, a warning. Stop digging, it said, or you'll regret it. I knew they were serious, but I couldn't stop now. Too many lives had been ruined. Too many people had suffered. I took the files to the authorities, to journalists, to anyone who would listen. The story spread, the evidence too damning to ignore. Investigations were launched. Arrests were made. The project was exposed, its backers scrambling to cover their tracks. It wasn't easy, and it wasn't quick. There were threats, intimidation, attempts to discredit me. But I kept fighting, driven by the need for justice, for closure. The figures still haunted my dreams, their whispers, a constant reminder of what I had endured. But I wouldn't let them win. I wouldn't let them silence me. In the end, we brought them down. The project was shut down. The researchers arrested. Their careers ruined. It didn't erase the nightmare. Didn't heal the scars. But it was something. It was a victory. A step towards reclaiming my life. I still struggle with sleep. With the fear of being pulled back into the void. The figures are weaker now. Their whispers fading, but they're still there, a shadow in the back of my mind. But I'm stronger too. I faced my fears, confronted the darkness, and survived. I won't let them win. So if you're reading this, if you've been through something similar, know that you're not alone. There is hope. There is a way out. It's a long, hard road, but you can make it. You can fight back and you can win. Stay strong, keep fighting, and never, ever give up. The CIA's mind control drugs turned my friends into monsters. Hey Reddit, I need to get this off my chest. I can't live with this secret any longer. I used to work for the government, specifically for a shadowy division of the CIA. My job was to test experimental drugs on volunteers. We were told these drugs were harmless, meant to enhance cognitive functions or treat mental illnesses, but the reality was far more sinister. It all started about six years ago. I was fresh out of college with a degree in biochemistry. The pay was great, and the secrecy was thrilling. I thought I was doing something important, something that mattered. I was wrong. We were testing drugs designed to control minds, to manipulate thoughts and behavior. And my friends, my closest friends, were among the test subjects. There were six of us. Me, Sam, Lisa, Eric, Jake, and Amy. We had been friends since high school, inseparable. We all needed money, and when I told them about the program, they jumped at the chance. The experiment started innocuously enough, just a few pills here and there, some monitoring, nothing major, but things escalated quickly. The first sign of trouble was with Jake. He started experiencing severe headaches and blackouts. We thought it was just a side effect, something that would pass. But then he started hearing voices, seeing things that weren't there. One night, he woke up screaming, saying something was crawling under his skin. We took him to the ER, but they couldn't find anything wrong. He was sent home with some painkillers and told to rest. The next day, Jake didn't show up for his appointment. I went to his apartment to check on him. What I found still haunts me. 
His place was trashed, like a tornado had hit it. There were scratches on the walls, deep gouges, and blood smears everywhere. I found Jake in the bathroom, curled up in the bathtub, rocking back and forth. His eyes were wild, unfocused. He kept muttering about the whispers and how they wouldn't stop. I tried to get him to a hospital, but he attacked me, screaming that I was one of them. I had to leave him there, for my own safety. Lisa was next. She was always the strong one, the one who kept us grounded. But after a few weeks on the drugs, she started changing. She became paranoid, convinced that everyone was out to get her. She started locking herself in her apartment, refusing to see anyone. When I finally managed to get inside, I found her scribbling on the walls with a knife, strange symbols and words that made no sense. Her hands were covered in cuts, her eyes hollow and empty. She looked at me like I was a stranger, someone to be feared. I tried to get through to her, but it was like she wasn't there anymore. Eric and Amy tried to quit the program after that, but it was too late. The drugs had already taken hold. Eric started experiencing violent outbursts, attacking anyone who got too close. He was arrested for assaulting a neighbor and sent to a psychiatric facility. Amy withdrew completely, losing herself in a world of hallucinations and delusions. She believed she was being watched, that tiny cameras were embedded in her skin. She cut herself open, trying to dig them out. She almost bled to death before I found her. Sam was the last to fall. He was my best friend, more like a brother. He tried to keep it together, for all of us. But the drugs broke him too. He became obsessed with the idea that we were all part of some grand experiment, that our lives were being controlled. He started talking about the others, shadowy figures that watched us, manipulated us. He stopped sleeping, convinced they would get him if he closed his eyes. One night he snapped. He attacked me, screaming that I was one of them that I was in on it. I had to defend myself, and in the struggle, he fell and hit his head. He didn't make it. I reported everything to my superiors, but they just shrugged it off, said it was all part of the process. They didn't care about the lives being destroyed, the people being turned into monsters. I couldn't take it anymore. I left, but the guilt stayed with me. I ruined my friends' lives. I destroyed them. I'm posting this here because I need people to know the truth. The government is playing with things they don't understand, things that can destroy lives. I don't expect forgiveness, but maybe, just maybe, someone will read this and stop them before it's too late. I thought things couldn't get worse after Sam died. I was wrong. The fallout from that night was immediate and brutal. The agency swept everything under the rug. Sam's death was ruled an accident, and they hushed up the incidents with Jake, Lisa, Eric, and Amy. They couldn't afford to let the public know what was really happening. I was left to pick up the pieces, knowing the truth, but powerless to do anything about it. I tried to move on to forget, but the nightmares kept coming. I saw their faces every time I closed my eyes. Sam's eyes, wild with fear and betrayal. Jake's haunted look as he rocked back and forth in that bathtub. Lisa's vacant stare, Eric's rage, and Amy's desperate, bloodied hands. I couldn't escape them. I started drinking to numb the pain, but it only made things worse. One night, in a drunken stupor, I decided to go back to the lab. I had to know more, to find out if there was any way to undo what had been done. I broke in and started going through the files, looking for anything that might help. What I found was beyond disturbing. The experiments were part of a program called 
project Mindbreak. The goal was to develop drugs that could control people's thoughts and actions to create the perfect soldiers, obedient and without fear. But the side effects were catastrophic. The files detailed numerous cases like my friends, people who had been driven insane, turned into mindless husks or violent maniacs. The agency knew about the risks but continued anyway, seeing the potential benefits as worth the cost. I found a file on myself, detailing my recruitment and my involvement in the program. They had been monitoring me too, using me to see how far they could push someone before they broke. I was just another pawn in their game. But what shocked me most was a file labeled Phase 2. It described a plan to release the drugs into the general population to test their effects on a larger scale. They were planning to use an upcoming flu vaccination drive as cover. I knew I had to do something. I couldn't let this happen. I copied everything I could onto a flash drive and got out of there, but I wasn't careful enough. They must have been watching because when I got back to my apartment, there were men waiting for me. They grabbed me, dragged me into a van and took me to a dark room somewhere. They tied me to a chair and started asking questions. At first, they tried to be nice, asking where I had been what I had taken. When I didn't answer, they got rough. They beat me, broke my fingers, trying to get me to talk. But I held out. I knew if I told them, they would destroy the evidence and I would disappear, just like all the others. They left me alone in that room for what felt like days. No food, no water, just the sound of my own ragged breathing and the occasional scream from somewhere far off, I started to lose track of time, slipping in and out of consciousness. Eventually, they came back, but this time they had a different approach. They brought in someone else, Jake, or at least it looked like Jake. He was emaciated, his eyes sunken and hollow. He didn't recognize me at first, just stared blankly ahead, then slowly he began to speak. He told me about the voices, how they never stopped, how they told him to do things, terrible things. He showed me the scars on his arms, where he had tried to cut them out. He said they had been experimenting on him, trying to refine the drugs to make them more effective. Seeing him like that broke something inside me. I couldn't let them do this to anyone else. I started talking telling them what they wanted to know. They seemed satisfied and left, promising to come back for me, but I knew they wouldn't let me live. I had to get out. I waited until they came to check on me again, and when they did, I attacked. I fought with everything I had left, managing to overpower the guard and get his keys. I stumbled out of the building, running as fast as I could. I didn't stop until I reached a payphone and called the only person I could think of, an old friend from college who had gone into journalism. I told him everything, begged him to meet me. He agreed, and we met in a seedy motel room where I handed over the flash drive and told him to get the story out. He promised he would, but I could see the fear in his eyes. He knew how dangerous this was. I didn't hear from him again. I don't know if he got the story out, if anyone believed him. All I know is that I've been on the run ever since, looking over my shoulder, waiting for them to catch up to me. I changed my name, my appearance, but I know it's only a matter of time. They won't stop until I'm dead. I'm posting this now because I don't think I have much time left. If you're reading this, know that the government is playing with fire and innocent people are getting burned. Don't trust them. Don't let them control you. And if you can, spread the word. Maybe together we can stop them.
before it's too late. After I handed over the flash drive to my journalist friend, I went underground. I knew the CIA wouldn't stop looking for me. I changed my name to David, dyed my hair, grew a beard, and moved to a small town in the Midwest. I kept my head down, took up odd jobs, and tried to blend in. But the paranoia never left. I kept expecting to see those men in black suits around every corner. Weeks turned into months, and I started to relax, thinking maybe I had escaped. That was a mistake. One night, I came home to find my apartment door ajar. My heart pounded as I stepped inside. Everything looked normal, but I knew better. They had been there. I found a note on my kitchen table, written in blood-red ink. We haven't forgotten. I packed a bag and left town that night. I couldn't risk staying in one place for too long. I moved from city to city, taking on different identities, doing whatever I could to stay off the radar. But no matter where I went, I felt their presence, always just a step behind. I saw shadows following me, heard whispers in the night, felt eyes watching me. I tried reaching out to old friends, but it was no use. The few who answered were terrified, told me never to contact them again. They had been threatened, just like me. I was alone. One night, while holed up in a cheap motel in Denver, I got a call. It was a blocked number. Against my better judgment, I answered. A familiar voice came through the line. It was Jake. At first, I thought it was a cruel trick. But then he started telling me things only Jake would know. Details from our childhood. Secrets we had shared. My heart ached hearing his voice again. But something was off. His tone was flat, emotionless. David, he said, they're coming for you. You can't run forever. They want you back in the program. I asked him where he was, if he was safe. But he just repeated the same thing over and over. They want you back. The line went dead. I knew it wasn't Jake talking. It was them using him as a puppet. They had broken him completely. I packed my things and left, heading to the one place I thought they wouldn't look for me. A remote cabin in the woods I had once visited with my family. It was far off the grid. No electricity. No phone service. I thought I could hide there, regroup, figure out my next move. But the isolation only made things worse. The silence was deafening, and my mind played tricks on me. I saw shadows moving outside, heard footsteps on the porch at night. I was losing my grip on reality. One night, I woke up to the sound of scratching at the door. I grabbed the rusty old shotgun my dad had left there and crept towards the sound. The door burst open and I fired blindly. The flash of the gun illuminated a face I knew too well. Amy. She collapsed, blood pouring from her chest. I dropped the gun, screaming. I ran to her, trying to stop the bleeding, but it was too late. She looked up at me, eyes full of pain and confusion, and whispered, Why, David? I was in shock. How had she found me? Then I noticed the small device in her hand, a GPS tracker. They had sent her to find me, to bring me back. I buried her in the woods behind the cabin, my hands shaking, tears streaming down my face. I couldn't believe what I had done. I was becoming as much of a monster as they were. I knew I couldn't stay there. I had to keep moving, keep running. I made my way to the nearest town, bought a burner phone, and called the only person left who might be able to help. An old college professor who had always been skeptical of government overreach. I explained everything, and he agreed to meet me. We met in a dingy bar in the middle of nowhere. He listened to my story, his face growing paler by the minute. He believed me, but he didn't know what to do. 
He suggested going to the media, but I told him about my journalist friend and how he had vanished. The professor looked scared, but he agreed to help me get the story out in another way. We spent the next few days holed up in a motel, writing down everything I knew, gathering evidence, and planning our next move. But they were always a step ahead. One morning, I woke up to find the professor gone. His side of the room was ransacked, blood smeared across the sheets. A note was pinned to the door. You can't escape. I knew they were right. I couldn't keep running forever, but I couldn't give up either. I had to find a way to stop them, to expose what they were doing. I packed my things and left, heading towards the only place I thought I might find answers, the original lab where it all started. I made my way back to the city, using back roads and staying off the grid. When I arrived, the lab was abandoned, but I broke in anyway. I needed to find something, anything that could help. The place was a mess, files scattered everywhere, equipment smashed. They had tried to destroy everything, but I found one file hidden away, marked Project Rebirth. The file detailed a new phase of the experiments, using advanced technology to amplify the drug's effects. They were planning to test it on a large scale using unsuspecting civilians. They had moved the operation to a new facility, hidden deep in the mountains. I knew I had to go there to stop them once and for all. I gathered what little supplies I had and set out, determined to end this nightmare. I didn't know if I would make it out alive, but I had to try. For Jake, Lisa, Eric, Amy, and Sam, for everyone who had suffered because of this madness. I traveled to the mountains with a mix of fear and determination, hoping to find and expose the new facility before they could implement their twisted plans. The journey was treacherous and I had to stay vigilant, knowing that any slip up could mean the end for me. The isolation of the mountains was eerie with only the sound of my footsteps and the occasional rustle of wildlife to keep me company. The facility was well hidden, nestled deep within the dense forest. It took me days of searching before I found it, a nondescript building that looked like an abandoned warehouse. I scoped it out from a distance, observing the guards and trying to figure out the best way to get inside. They were heavily armed and it was clear they weren't taking any chances. I waited until nightfall, using the cover of darkness to slip past the perimeter. I found a ventilation duct and managed to pry it open, crawling inside and navigating the narrow claustrophobic passageways. The air was stale and I had to move slowly to avoid making noise. After what felt like hours, I found an exit and dropped into a dimly lit corridor. The inside of the facility was a stark contrast to the outside. It was pristine, with gleaming floors and state-of-the-art equipment. I moved cautiously, keeping to the shadows and avoiding the occasional patrol. I needed to find the control center, where they would be coordinating the experiments. I stumbled upon a lab room filled with cages each containing a test subject. Some were human, others animals, all in various states of distress. The humans looked like they had been through hell, gaunt, eyes hollow, some muttering to themselves, others staring blankly into space. I recognized a few faces from the files I had read, people who had been declared missing or dead. They were using them as guinea pigs, refining their mind control drugs and pushing the limits of human endurance. I felt a surge of anger and despair. I wanted to help them, to set them free, but I knew I couldn't risk blowing my cover. I pressed on, 
determined to reach the control center and find something I could use to shut this place down. I found the control room on the second floor, guarded by two men. I waited for an opportunity and ambushed them, taking them out silently. Inside, I found banks of monitors displaying live feeds from various parts of the facility, along with detailed logs of their experiments. I quickly started downloading everything onto a flash drive. As I worked, I heard a noise behind me. I turned to see Jake standing in the doorway, flanked by two guards. He looked worse than before, his skin pale, eyes sunken and lifeless. But there was a flicker of recognition in his eyes, a brief moment of clarity. David, he said, his voice a hollow echo of the friend I once knew. You shouldn't have come here. Before I could respond, the guards grabbed me, forcing me to my knees. Jake walked over, looking down at me with a mix of sadness and resignation. They won't let you leave. You know too much. I struggled against the guards, but they held me fast. Jake reached into his pocket and pulled out a syringe filled with a familiar translucent liquid. I'm sorry, he whispered and plunged the needle into my arm. The world went hazy, my vision blurring as the drug took effect. I felt a wave of nausea, my thoughts becoming muddled. They dragged me down the hall and into a cell, locking me inside. I fought to stay conscious, to keep my mind clear, but it was a losing battle. Hours, maybe days, passed in a foggy blur. I was subjected to their tests injected with various substances, electrodes attached to my head. They were trying to break me, to turn me into one of their mindless puppets. But I clung to the thought of my friends, to the promise I had made to stop this madness. One day, I woke to find Lisa in the cell next to mine. She looked at me with empty eyes, a shell of the strong, vibrant person she once was. David. She whispered, her voice trembling. They, they did things to me. I can't, I can't stop them. I reached through the bars, trying to comfort her, but she recoiled as if my touch burned. They'll do the same to you, she said, tears streaming down her face. There's no escape, but I couldn't accept that. I had to find a way out to stop them. I started feigning compliance, pretending the drugs were working, letting them think they had broken me. I waited for the right moment, biding my time. That moment came when they moved me to a different cell, closer to the exit. The guard escorting me was careless, and I managed to overpower him, taking his keycard. I ran through the facility, alarms blaring knowing this was my only chance. I made it to the control room, locking the door behind me. I accessed the computer system, triggering a facility-wide lockdown and releasing the test subjects from their cages. Chaos erupted as the guards tried to regain control, but the subjects fought back with a desperate ferocity. I downloaded the remaining files onto my flash drive and made my way to the exit. The hallways were a war zone, with test subjects and guards battling it out. I saw Lisa and Jake among them, their faces twisted with rage and pain. I wanted to help them, but I knew I had to get out and expose the truth. I reached the exit and burst into the cool night air, running into the woods. I didn't stop until I reached a nearby town, where I used a payphone to call my journalist contact. By some miracle, he answered. I told him where to meet me and waited, my heart pounding. When he arrived, I handed over the flash drive, begging him to get the story out. He promised he would, but I knew it was a race against time. The CIA would come for me and they wouldn't stop until they had silenced me for good. I didn't have much time left. 
I knew it was only a matter of days, maybe hours, before the CIA tracked me down. My journalist friend, Paul, promised to do everything he could to get the story out. He arranged for me to stay in a safe house while he worked on the article, a small isolated cabin in the middle of nowhere. It felt like I was back where I started, hiding from shadows in the wilderness. The wait was agonizing. Every rustle in the bushes, every creak of the cabin, set my nerves on edge. I couldn't sleep, couldn't eat. I just sat by the window, clutching the shotgun I'd found in the cabin, and watched the tree line for any signs of movement. Paul called me a few days later, his voice tense. David, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is, I've managed to get enough of the story out to some trusted contacts in the media. They're working on it, trying to verify the details. It should go public soon. And the bad news? I asked, my heart sinking. The bad news is, they've found you. You need to get out of there now. I've arranged for a car to pick you up and take you to a secure location, but you have to move fast. I didn't waste any time. I grabbed my bag and headed out of the door, glancing back at the cabin one last time. The car was waiting at the end of the dirt road, an old beat up sedan with tinted windows. I climbed in and the driver, a nervous looking young man, took off without a word. We drove for hours, the tension in the car palpable. I kept checking the rear view mirror expecting to see black SUVs closing in on us, but the roads were empty. Finally, we arrived at an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of a small town. The driver handed me a new phone and some cash, then sped off, leaving me alone once again. I made my way inside the warehouse, finding a makeshift living area set up in one of the back rooms. There was a laptop on a rickety table a stack of canned food, and a sleeping bag on the floor. I sat down at the laptop and checked my email. There was a message from Paul with a link to a secure website. I clicked on it and a video started playing. It was Paul, looking haggard and exhausted. David, if you're watching this, it means I didn't make it. They're closing in on me but I've managed to upload all the evidence to multiple servers. The story is out there now. People are starting to take notice. You did it. You exposed them. I felt a mix of relief and despair. We had succeeded, but at what cost? I wondered how many more lives would be lost before the truth came out fully. As I sat there, the weight of everything crashing down on me, I heard a noise behind me. I turned to see Lisa standing in the doorway. She looked different, more composed, but there was still a haunted look in her eyes. David, she said softly, I need to talk to you. I stood up, wary. Lisa, how did you find me? They let me go, she said, stepping closer. After you escaped, everything fell apart. The facility went into lockdown but the guards couldn't handle the chaos. A lot of us got out, but they didn't let us go without a reason. I narrowed my eyes. What do you mean? They want to control the narrative, she explained. They knew the story would get out eventually, so they're trying to spin it, make it look like you were the one responsible for everything. They're painting you as the mastermind behind a rogue experiment. I felt a cold pit in my stomach. What are you saying, Lisa? Are you here to help me or to bring me in? She looked conflicted, tears welling up in her eyes. I'm here to help you, David, but you need to understand they're not going to stop. They want to erase everything, everyone who knows the truth. Before I could respond, the warehouse door burst open and a team of armed men stormed in. Lisa and I raised our hands, but it was too late. 
They grabbed us, forcing us to the ground. I struggled, but the fight was beaten out of me quickly. They dragged us to a black SUV and threw us in the back. As we drove away, I looked at Lisa, who was staring straight ahead, her face set in a grim mask of determination. Hours later, we arrived at another facility, this one even more secure than the last. They separated us, taking me to a sterile white room with a single chair in the center. I was strapped down, and a man in a lab coat walked in, carrying a syringe. You've caused us a lot of trouble, David, he said, his voice cold and clinical. But that's all over now. We're going to fix you. Make sure you can't hurt anyone else. I struggled against the restraints, but it was no use. The needle pierced my skin, and a wave of numbness washed over me. My vision blurred, and I felt myself slipping away. The last thing I saw was Lisa standing in the doorway, her eyes filled with sorrow. I'm sorry, David, she whispered, as the darkness closed in. I don't know how much time has passed since then. They keep me sedated, locked away in a cell somewhere deep underground, but I know the truth is out there. Paul got the story out, and people are starting to ask questions. Maybe one day, someone will find me, and I'll get a chance to tell the whole story. Until then, all I can do is wait, and hope that the truth will finally set us free.